Thank you for joining me for another episode of Eric Wade Whiskey Studies and my continuing series on the history of Scotch whiskey. Uh, in this video, we're going to cover uh, the expansion uh, and sort of peaking of exports. Um, while I'm going over my notes, I'm going to be enjoying a special bottle of uh, the Johnny Walker Black. So Johnny Walker Black, probably uh, one of the most available um, uh, blended Scotch whiskeys. I think it has a high quality price ratio. This is the double black, which probably goes for between $26 and $30. And, and what I'm gonna be enjoying while going over my notes is a special bottle. This is the uh, Johnny Walker Black, the Director's Cut Blade Runner Edition. This is bottled at 49% alcohol uh, by uh, volume. So 2049, 49 ABV. I have two bottles of this, got them for a decent price. Uh, I really, really like it. The only sad thing is I really, really wish they bottled the Johnny Walker Black at 49% or even a little higher on a regular basis because this is absolutely fantastic. I think if they made a regular bottling of a higher ABV uh, Johnny Walker Black, I think it would do extremely well. Alrighty, let's get into the notes. Despite the rise in single malt sales, blended scotch still accounts for approximately 90% of all scotch whiskey sold, although single malts represent 20% of scotch whiskey sales in terms of value and are therefore a very valuable long-term element contributing to distillers' profits, which is why I'm doing a blend uh, during this review. On the nose... It has just a whiff of smoke. When I was first getting into whiskeys, it was probably the Bunnhaven 12 and the Johnny Walker Black with just a, a minuscule amount of peat that sort of got my foot in the door for enjoying peated whiskeys. It has some nice fruit notes. You can tell the difference between a malt and a blend because some of the spirit, non-malt grain, uh, it shows up. But other than that, it's got some nice tropical fruit notes. Some pear, peach, apricot, hint of smoke, a little bit of citrus. It's actually quite nice. All right, let's get on with the notes. In terms of blends, the leading brand being Diageo's Johnny Walker, with 21.6% of global market share in 2014, followed by Pernod Ricard's Ballantine, which accounted for 6.8%. In 2001, Pernod Ricard and Diageo bought Seagram Spirits and Wine, with Pernod taking control of Shiva's Brothers Scotch Whiskey Operations. Four years later, the Scotch Whiskey Distilleries and Brands of Allied Dominique were added to Shiva's portfolio, with Ballantines being the prize asset. During the past three decades, there has been a general pattern of increasing export sales and a growing diversity of export markets, notably across Asia, South America and Africa, with scotch now available in some 200 countries. And let's take a little sip. Hmm. A little sweetness there. Nice, smooth, silky, creamy. It has just a hint of smoke running through everything. Hmm. Can't say it's overly complex. It has some basic stone fruits some candied apricots, maybe a little bit of sort of like a apricot jam character to it. it has a, a, a slight chocolate notes to it, and that smoke is just going in and out of it. Really, really, really nice. So if you're traveling and you're at a hotel, or you're at a bar, you know, a small little bar at a hotel, um, or you're on an airplane and they have Johnny Walker Black, that's what I tend to go for. The favorite blended, the best blended scotch in the history of the world, Johnny Walker Black. Breakfast of champions, except no, <laughs> except no substitutes. The high point for Scotch whiskey exports came in 2012 when they earned a record of 4.3 billion pounds, representing an increase of 87% during the previous decade. That year, Scotch whiskey was worth 135 pounds per second to the UK balance of trade. Since 2012, Export sales have fallen back 
being worth 3.95 billion pounds in 2014, but the sheer breadth and diversity of markets in which Scotch whiskey sells seems likely to ensure that even if sales to some countries decrease, as they have in the case of China, where export files fell by 23% from 2013 to 2014, overall, the Scotch whiskey industry is unlikely to experience the profound periods of bust that have historically followed boom. Demonstrating that breadth and diversity, in 2014, the USA continued to be the top export market by value, followed by France, but the leading dozen markets also includes Taiwan coming in third, Singapore coming in fourth, South Africa coming in seventh, Mexico coming in tenth, and India in eleventh. Diageo's dominant position is built on a strategy to build its world market for blends. This has risks as it needs as much whiskey as it can to meet escalating demand, but it has also made room for competitors with niche products and expressions, particularly of single malts. The other danger for the whiskey trade is that Diageo will follow the market in investing in new capacity for its now large portfolio of spirits, for example, the 25 million euro recent investment in Irish whiskey. So I know a lot of people, you know, we like real high quality whiskeys. Uh, most of us who watch videos, watch um, whiskey t videos, uh, or, or we ourselves are whiskey tubers, we are really the minor in terms of consumers. Uh, we aren't really representative of the majority of consumers. We tend to know more. We tend to be a little bit more geeky. Um, you know, we do a lot more exploration. I mean, if you're watching my videos, you are particularly a whiskey geek, right? Most people just want to drink whiskey. They don't want to know anything about it, right? So, a lot of us whiskey geeks tend to stick our nose up at um, uh, the large conglomerates. Everything in life has pros and cons. Everything has weaknesses and strengths. You know, your small distillery, small production distillery, they tend to be, you know, uh, from grain to glass. They tend to uh, be more artisan, um, you know, and we like that, right? They tend to go higher ABV, right? Because they're looking for higher quality, not quantity. But they also tend to be more expensive. They tend to be difficult to get. They tend to sell out faster. Uh, and really, our craft distillers are not the ones who are sort of uh, pushing the frontiers of whiskey around the world and making Scotch whiskey known, right? The reality is, it's the big guys who uh, are making Scotch whiskey a name around the world. They're the ones doing a lot more advertising. They're the ones who are introducing more markets, more people to whiskey, right? Getting people into the front door uh, to understand Scotch whiskey. And then later on, when people have had sort of the big conglomerate mass production whiskeys, then as they uh, increase in appreciation, then they come to the whiskeys that you and I tend to like, right? So you have to be thankful for what the big boys do. They do a lot of things right. Yeah, they do some things wrong as well. But um, the little guys would not be surviving. They, we would probably wouldn't even know about them if it wasn't for the big guys uh, making a name for Scotch whiskey around the world. So I have an appreciation for the big guys, um, despite their flaws and whatever, and they're sort of seeming, you know, uh, we are the Borg, you know, a re a resistance is futile, you know, sort of taking over everything. But let's move on. 1990. 192.9 MLA of malt whiskey and 235.9 MLA of grain whiskey were produced in Scotland, and these figures dipped to a low of 144.7 and 215.3 respectively in 2000, before beginning a relentless period of growth, culminating in a high of a 305.7 and 350 respectively in 2014. The number of operational distilleries in Scotland stood at 94 malt and 8 grain units in 1990, following to a low of 84 and 8 respectively six years later. Since then, the number of distilleries has risen in line with the growth in output, reaching 110 malt and 7 grain distilleries in 2015. Now, I'm going to state the obvious. There is so much happening right now that if you buy books on whiskey or wine for that factor, 
uh, that matter. As soon as you, it goes into print, it's already out of date. There's already new things happening, right? So my resources are books, but also online resources and printed materials, what's required for studying for classes is sometimes a little bit behind, uh, not completely up to date. So the, most of the dates, most up to dates, we're looking at 2015 to 2017 dates. And just within the last two years, a lot more has happened. Uh, so these might be slightly out of date. Um, there's now, last count on the SWA map was 128 distilleries. Um, of those, 81 were open to the public, and of those, 13 were grain distilleries. Uh, but even that is out to date, as just within this last year, new distilleries has opened. Many distilleries changed hands. For example, Brucolati was purchased by Mark Rayner, a wine merchant, in 2000. With his background in the wine trade, he laid great emphasis on terroir, and began producing an extensive range of limited editions, as well as strengthening his cash flow by producing botanist gin. He now has actually moved on to producing Irish whiskey. Um, there's a video, uh, the Scotch Test Dummies visited Ireland and had a lengthy interview with him. So uh, I'll put a link down below or somewhere, but you want to check out that video. He's now moved over to Ireland and left Brucolati. Ian McLeod, an independent family firm, purchased Glen Goyne in 2003 and Tamdu in 2011. In addition to the creation of new distilleries, leading producers such as Diageo and Shiva's Brothers have also invested significantly in increasing output at existing sites, largely to feed their blends. Alrighty, so, um, hmm, mm -mm -mm. So there's a symbiotic relationship between so malts and blends. If you didn't have the demand of the blends, there wouldn't be the production high enough of the single malts to keep the single malt distilleries in business um, because they wouldn't be producing enough single malt in order to uh, have a full profit. So some of the money comes from the sale of, of casks to blenders. So they, they make some money from that. But also without the single malts, the blenders wouldn't have anything to blend. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the, between the two. We tend to think of whiskeys, I think particularly in terms of how we have it, as I'm having it right now, by a single glass. Hmm. But a big market or avenue or use for whiskeys is for making cocktails. Uh, just, here, here's just an example. Um, the largest whiskey tuber channel, and I'm just using it as, an, as a sort of representative. The largest whiskey tuber channel is the whiskey vault, or the, yeah, the vault, yeah, the vault, and then there's a tribe. So it's the whiskey vault. 200,000 subscribers. Check out whiskey, or check out cocktail tubers. Um, there are cocktail tubers, who, you, know, you know, channels that focus on showing you how to make a cocktail that are half a million subscribers and there's more than one there's several of them that are that big cocktails are actually broader and more popular than just whiskey on its own all right there's a bigger audience there's a there's a broader audience uh for that so likewise just as there's a, there's a bigger and broader audience um for uh say alcoholic beverage or adult beverage whiskey tuber channels there's a broader audience for that so also there's a broader consumer base for those who are consuming uh, Scotch whiskeys as well, right? A lot of us, maybe we don't spend so much time thinking about cocktails other than on a real hot day and we're gonna blend something, you know, uh, to enjoy a cool beverage. But we have to think outside of our own, what we are into, what we like, because most of the world doesn't think the way we do. Um, small yays in particular, right? Sommeliers are the geekiest of geekiest in wines and whiskeys, and what their preferences are is not what the industry is marketing. They may know more. They may be able to have better tastes, you know, so-called, um, than, than everybody else. But the reality is, is they aren't representative of the broader market of the consumer, right? So, alrighty. I hope you have enjoyed this video. If you subscribe to this channel, I want to thank you very much. If you haven't yet subscribed, you like watching my videos, I would greatly appreciate it if you would subscribe. And if you have watched all my videos thus far, hang in there because we got one more. All right. Until next time, cheers.
It is a land with a legendary past is present everywhere. It is a land where passion lies in the shadow of the castles. And only here you get close to what really matters in life. Sharing precious moments with someone you love. Can I have my f***ing scotch, you f***ing moron? Red Bowler Scotch Whiskey. That's Scotland. 